So we did this problem by starting with the region and then basically writing down one way to go and it was impossible and then we went a different way. So this question could be asked starting here. I could ask you the question starting right there and not explicitly tell you the region but implicitly tell you the region. So you can get the region out of this. Not necessarily super easy to do, but you can get the region out of this. Well, it's not too bad. You can see uh, y is between 0 and 1. I like to start on the outside, so I can start drawing the region. 0, 1. I know it's all going to be between 0 and 1. Y. And then figure out, well, x equals 1 as a vertical line. And the other one, x equals y, is a horizontal line with slope 1. So you can reconstruct it. You may have to reconstruct the region and then change the order of integration. So that can be the tricky part, where I don't give you the region. You have to decide what it is and then flip the order. So that is how I could make this problem a little bit tougher. It's basically change the starting point. So I start you partially into the problem, except you don't actually realize that it's impossible, and you have to go in reverse and then re basically reorder the integral. Reordering the integral is not just switching these two right here. It sort of is, but not really. What happens when I switch them? It doesn't go y0 to y1. It doesn't go from y equals 0 to y equals 1 anymore. Uh, it does go from x equals 0 to x equals 1, but that was not x equals 0. That was x equals 1. So you don't just get to switch the order. Uh, you do switch the order in some sense, but the endpoints can change significantly when you do it. So you've got to be very aware of what you're doing. So you don't get to just, unless they're all numbers, then you can flip it around, but usually they won't be numbers. And we'll do one more example. This is the last one we're going to do from this section. Ooh, don't integrate this. Pretend I didn't write that. So what I want you to do is sketch the region and then reverse the order of integration. So what I just told you is you can't just change the 2 and the 2x and the 0 and the x squared. You can't just move those around. You have to know exactly what region, which is why I put that step first. So draw your region out and then change the order. If it helps out, you can write x equals and y equals, so you know which ones are which.
So what I wrote is almost right. What is wrong with what I wrote here? So my x endpoints. So y endpoints are good, 0 to 4. That was probably the first thing that I noticed was y is going to go from 0 to 4. So that was kind of easy. The inside ones, though, what is the big, so when we think of inside, we're thinking of x values. So what's the big x value? So if we draw a cross section right here, which is the big x value? Square root y is big and one half y is small. So you have to turn your head sideways and think, oh, we're basically on the x-axis, so what is big and what is small? So in this case, it's right minus left, or it's always big minus small. So we're going to go and clean up these. So 1 half y was a small, square root y is the big. And again, if I kept going with what I had, I would get negative the right answer, because I would have switched endpoints around. So that'll make your integral negative. So reversing the order of integration shouldn't change your value. So making a dy dx or dx dy shouldn't change the value. But changing endpoints is a different story when you actually reverse your endpoints. This is a relatively easy antiderivative right here. So we're not going to compute it. I don't think there will be much that we're going to learn from this. Uh, but I did want to take a problem and figure out what is the region, and then reverse the order. So we started with a setup integral, and then sort of took a step back, and then went the other way, the other order. So don't pay attention to these dates on here. I think these are the dates I made the whole notebook up. So those dates are pretty useless. So we just did volume by double integration. So we're going to look at area by double integration. That's weird. We did area by single integration before. So how are we going to use double integration to find area? So we're going to find the area of a region. And our region is going to be a subset of two-dimensional space. So we looked at volume before, volume of a height one region. over R. Let's draw a nice picture. So let's say our region looks like this, and a height 1 we'll just pretend that the height is 1 on this whole thing. So volume of height 1 region over R. So I just drew a one height uh, volume over some region R. How does the volume relate to the area if your height is one? Maybe the same. They'll be the same. So your volume of a height 1 region will equal the area of the region. Now, what about units? Technically, you'd have to multiply by area times unit, whatever unit you're using, to make your units match. But that's not the important part. The important part is the volume. Numer numerically, the volume will be the area of that region. And our volume. Integral height 1, we'll go double integral 
over R. So it's a little strange we're going to be integrating the constant function 1. And of course we're going to either go dx dy or dy dx depending on what we feel like doing or one of them may not be possible. So if we write area of the region R is the double integral over R of the function 1 dA. So I want you to find the area of this region, not in the calculus one way, but in the way I just showed you. So don't do it with a single integral, do it with a double integral, sketching your region out. And you can decide, do you want to go dy dx or dx dy? So sketch your region first, make sure your neighbor agrees with you. If you don't have a neighbor, turn around, make a new neighbor behind you or in front of you. I picked easy functions, they're not hard to graph, just don't mess them up. A line and a parabola. So I'm setting this up in the easiest way possible, in the easiest order here. Any questions on this setup? So if we actually integrate it, this is a very easy integral to do. And a derivative of 1, the y antiderivative is y, and then you plug in your endpoints and subtract them. So I'm going to skip and just shortcut that. So we're going to get x plus 2 minus x squared dx, right there. 
So I'm going to antiderivative and then subtract 10 points all at the same time. If you were in calculus one and I asked you for the area, this is what you would show me right here. Just big function minus little function from negative whatever one to positive two. So calc one, you would start down here. So let's do something tricky. Let's rewrite the integral with the other order. So I'm going to redraw the region. I drew a cross section the first time in pink. I'll draw a cross section this time, except my cross section is going to go horizontally like this. And my antiderivative will be 1 dx dy. All right, easy question. What are my y endpoints? 0, 2, 4. So that was pretty easy, that part. So let's look at the cross section. What are the endpoints of the cross section? What is wrong with this cross section in this region? Using the same function for so our right endpoint is totally fine. What about our left endpoint? It's going to switch over. So, unfortunately, we have to cut this into two pieces. So we have two regions now. And here is our second cross section in the other region. So unfortunately, there are two separate regions. So we're going to do area. So we have two separate regions. One of them goes 0 to 1 in y values, and the other one goes 1 to, three, one to 4. So already, I have to come through. So one of them goes 0 to 1. That's the bottom. Plus double integral 1 dx dy. y equals 1 to y equals 3. So any questions on that aspect? So we've done this type of thing before, where we had to, we basically switched our left endpoint, our small endpoint. And of course, that's the line y equals 1 is where this all happened. So that's why we had to split it at 1. These endpoints are really bad now. Or I should say the names of them are really bad. So let's come through and delete them. So I don't need y equals x squared. I need the inverse function. So that'll be x equals square root y. What about the x equals function for the linear? Is that right, y minus 2? Yep, that looks good. What about this function down here? So it's almost x equals root y, but it's x equals negative root y. That's the plus minus square root right there. Need more room. So that's x equals negative square root y. So any questions on that right there? That function changed from being positive square root y to being negative square root y.
And if you look, the function does not pass the horizontal line test, so it's not one-to-one, -one, the original function. So we're not going to be able to actually invert it. So that's why we get two separate pieces right there. So from 0 to 1, what is the small uh, x value? So it'll be minus square root y, and then the big from 0 to 1? Big square root, regular square root y. All right. <coughs> and then things change from y is 1 to 3. So what is our little x endpoint from past, when we pass 1? It'll be our y minus 2. And then the big one, square root y. And this should make sense. The big, the right side endpoint doesn't change, meaning the top endpoint for x is not going to change, the big one. But the small one definitely changes. So you see the small one make a change right there. So for this reason, if I was actually finding the area, I would go for the first one. The integral looks easy, and the setup was way easier in the first one. If I found that integral to be impossible, then I may have to switch to the second one. Correct. So I don't think we need to compute this. We already did it halfway. The rest is a calc one, and actually an easy calc one problem. So average value is what we're going to look at next of f. f is going to go from some region into R1. So we're assuming our region is two-dimensional. Trying to think of a nice way to write that mathematically. F of R bar. I feel like that means something else. That's good enough for now. We'll say that that's average. Average value of F over the entire region R. All right, how do we do this? Well, we have to get the total volume divided by the area. volume. Don't write down that weird symbol I just made up. I just made it up. So our volume is double integral over R, F of XY, DA, the area, double integral r of 1 dA. So that's the average value, the volume divided by the area right there. <coughs> Here's something very tempting but very wrong. <laughs> What's f divided by the number of one? The number one, the f. <laughs> so that's definitely not going to work uh, because that is in fact equal to that right there. So that's definitely not going to work out. If they were subtracted, that's a different story. But there is no quotient rule for antiderivatives. 
so it's definitely not going to work out the other way. All right, back in the good old days when f went from a set or some interval into R1, where I was usually a closed interval AB. Average value it was one divided by the length times the area. So that was what it looked like before. Which you could summarize as one over the length times area. So you're basically taking a higher dimensional measurement and dividing it by one uh, measurement one dimensional lower. Depending on your units, pressure is a force divided by an area. So there are a lot of things that are computed in, in these type of ways, just depending on what your units are. So a lot of things like resistance and other fun stuff that also is treated in a very similar way, but I don't know very much about science and physics and all that stuff. So this process is used quite a bit. We're going to take something and figure out if I divide it by some area, length, volume, whatever, you can get density and all types of other fun stuff. So we're just going to stick with average values. And we'll do our first example. This function will be x times cosine of x, y. And our region R, we'll keep it easy and have a nice rectangle. So I will find the area of the region, and you find the volume on top of that area. So there's the region R sketched out very quickly. Just go 0 to pi in the x and 0 to 1 in the y. So it just looks like that. All right, so here is pi. So that was easy. So set up your volume integral and figure out what's the volume. Rectangle is the only time you can switch your order without actually thinking very much. Because our functions are constant. So rectangle is the only time you're allowed to just flip it around without using uh, without having to redraw your area, your region, and think very carefully about changing things from x to y.
I did guess and check on my der antiderivative. You can do a u sub if you want to. So if you don't look happy, you probably want to see the u sub. So there's the the u sub if you want to see the intermediate u sub steps. It's a little weird because you're letting u equal x y, but then you're taking a y derivative, not a partial. Uh, technically, it's a partial. Any questions? Who tried to go the other way? I didn't want to take an x antiderivative of x times. I probably could. What rule would I need to use? Is it a rule? Should we call it a rule? Yeah, integration by parts. Not really a rule. It's more of a method. All right, I'd have to probably go integration by parts because I need to lower my power of x by 1 and go that way. But I decided, why go that route if you don't have to? So flip the order. That was easy. And then that was a relatively easy antiderivative. So that's the volume. What do we do to get the average value? Yep, that's it. Volume over area. Our volume was 2, our area was pi, whatever units, 2 over pi units squared. No, is that right? Average value? It would just be in regular units. That's the end of 15.3. So we're moving quickly. There's not very much in 15.3. Trying to put markings down for lines. Oh well. So let's talk about polar form and how we take measurements in polar form. So unfortunately, in polar form, measurements are weird. That's a rectangle in polar form right there. 
It's a polar rectangle. So polar rectangles, they do sort of have four sides. Two of them are generally curved, and two of them are straight but not parallel. They're radial, you could call them. There is one type of polar rectangle that doesn't really have four sides, and it's the small one at the center. That's closer to a, maybe they call it a sector of a circle, a little slice of a circle. So either way, your polar rectangle looks weird. I think we can all agree on that. Oh, okay, very nice. So we're going to have to figure out how do we get the area. So we're gonna need some measurements here. We are also going to assume that delta R is very small. So I drew it way wider than it's going to be. So we're gonna assume delta R is super small. So we got delta R. This measurement right here is gonna be R. The angle measurement we take is gonna be delta theta. And if we need it, the coordinates of this point are gonna be R comma theta. So we're in polar coordinates, so R is the first coordinate, theta is the second coordinate. So that single point will be R theta. So we need arc length, and I'll go with, oh, let's go pink for that. So I want to get the arc length of that pink arc right there. So arc length, anybody remember the arc length formula? That's it. And what units do we have to measure in? This is in radians. So we need to be in radians. So this is arc length equals r times theta. When theta is measured in radians. In this picture, it's a little bit strange, but what is theta? in this little wedge that I drew. It's not actually theta. It's delta theta because it changes theta. So in, in our picture, it's going to be delta theta is our angle that we're using. So for us, let me just circle these. Our arc length, it is r, but it's times delta theta, so r angle is delta theta. Now definitely if you go out further on the radius you're going to get a bigger arc length obviously. If you go way down to zero you're going to get zero arc length. If you go far out you can get a really big arc length. So that is our arc length right there. The way we're going to measure the area of this is we're going to take the arc length and multiply it by the thickness. So we're going to take whatever the arc length of that, in this case, pink arc right here, and we're going to multiply it by the thickness. What variable measures the thickness of the, what do we call it, a polar rectangle? Delta R. So that's our delta R right there. So we said our arc length is R times delta theta times thickness, which is delta R. <coughs> and we'll change the order. So it's going to be R, delta R, delta 
delta theta. Oh, we're not at double integral yet. So our volume is going to be make infinite number of these little sector or uh, rectangular regions. So this part right here, this is the height. So the height we are above the little rectangular sector. And then we're multiplied by the area, which is AK. So I'm just going to copy the R delta R delta theta. So that's the area of rectangular sector. Rectangular, let's call it subdivision. And of course, we're going to take a, in this limit, that turns into a double integral, and delta r is dr, delta theta is d theta. So when we actually apply this limit, we get the double integral over the region r, f of r theta. We get an extra multiply by r dr d theta. So there's an extra r in there. Don't forget about the extra r. So I put a little extra note. There's an extra r. So it's almost exactly like volume before, except you have the extra little r dr d theta. So that should seem a little strange, but when you think about how we measured these and the actual area, just think if r, right here, r gets really big, you could have the same theta, but your area is going to get a lot bigger. So if this r is twice as far out, your area is going to be twice as big, basically. When r is really small, your area is going to be really small. So that's why you get that extra r in there.